received a PhD in computer science from Boston University and a medical degree from Brown University. And it's his expertise in these two fields that set the stage for his life's work and for his talk today. When preparing this introduction, I thought that first I would list his awards and titles and accomplishments, but then I realized that it would take 30 minutes. So instead, I'm just going to give a, a small sample. Uh, he is professor of pediatrics and health sciences and technology at Harvard Medical School. He leads a doctoral program in genetics and bioinformatics there and at MIT. He's director of Children's Hospital Informatics Program, director of Conway Library of Medicine, director of I2B2 National Center for Biomedical Computing, and co-director of Harvard Medical School for Biomedical Informatics. He is a founder of the Center for Outcome and Policy Research at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and the founder and associate director for the Center of Genetic Epidemiology at Harvard Medical School. He has received numerous awards, including the Dr. Donald Lindbergh Award for Innovation for Informatics from the American Medical, American Medical Informatics Association. He is a fellow of the American College of Medical Information and the Society of Pediatric Research. As an expert in both medicine and machine learning, he has published over 200 papers in a widely used textbook. And believe it or not, he somehow also finds time to be a practicing pediatric endocrinologist and a father of three. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to uh, yield the podium to Dr. Kohane to tell us about his keynote address, which is Biomedical Wants of the World Unite. We have nothing to lose but our disease burden. Dr. Hanek. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. Let's see. Great. Okay. So my job in the next uh, 50 minutes is to convince you uh, to get off of your uh, butt and to actually um, activate yourselves to do something really important for society. Because you hold in your heads the skills, the knowledge, and I would argue the willingness to change medicine in ways that it needs to do in a dire fashion. Now, I realize that I use my slides as a cue to my talking item have much of a uh, cue here. Is there any way to reflect the, uh, the show in, in this uh, view? I forget. All right, so let's move forward. So what's, what's the context here? So I'm going to have to look sort of sideways to give myself a reminder. Uh, so unlike many uh, countries, we do not have a health. I, I don't mind the mouse, but I, I just I can't see it. I can't see my slides. Is it on your screen? No. No. Is it on your other desk? No. There. That's good. Ah, excellent. Fine. Um, so yes. So there's no national health identifier. Uh, there's lots of models for getting paid. There's not a single payer system, although in some countries there are. And um, let's see. electronic health records are very were very poorly implemented in this country until about uh, seven years ago when the Obama administration implemented a forty to fifty dollar billion dollar bribery program where doctors each got $44,000 to adopt electronic health records. And that's had the effect of having these electronic health records adopted by over 50% of the practices in the United States, but as I'll argue shortly, at the cost of having adopted uh, technology that is state of the art for approximately 1980. 
And there, we're now in a situation where we actually have multiple alternate models of healthcare delivery that are being offered. Even at Harvard Medical School, you will see in the middle of this in medical industrial complex, a small little clinic by CVS and a pharmacy company where you can be seen for small uh, medical problems. And most people, if they have a small medical problem, if they have ear infection, if they need a vaccination, they'll go there. They will not go to one of the healthcare systems. So we're p potentially at a point of disruption. And right now, there's also a threat and a promise, a threat to the healthcare system and a promise to the rest of us that we're no longer going to pay doctors for doing things to us, but we're actually pay them based on how well we do after the fact. And as a result of this, Healthcare systems are beginning to become aware that they're going to be able to monetize their own data. And nowhere is there a clearer side of that than there's a big healthcare system in um, Pennsylvania called the Geisinger Health Healthcare System. And they have entered into an agreement with Regeneron Pharmaceuticals so that their entire healthcare system, including the genomics from whole exome or whole genome sequencing, of their populations becomes risk for the mill for discovery science. <coughs> I want to use the following metaphor in this discussion. There are afferent and efferent arms of healthcare information. So metaphorically, just as we sense data from our skin and other senses uh, and integrate them in our central nervous system, so do we gather healthcare data from the patients from society. And also, just as we have an efferent system where the impulses go out through our motor nerves to actually uh, cause our muscles to twitch and do something useful to the environment, so too must a healthful, fully functioning uh, healthcare information economy also have an efferent axis. So first I'm going to talk about the afferent axis. I'm showing this slide just to remind ourselves that the use of big data goes way back. This is uh, photographs from uh, the Salpêtrière Hospital in uh, France, where uh, Jean-Martin Charcot uh, discovered many of the important uh, neurological diseases by literally looking at everybody in his large psychiatric hospital. And instead of looking at these as a bunch of unrelated, messy cases. He systematized them, he followed their course, and he actually defined new disease trajectories that were both predictive of outcome and of therapeutic response. There is no reason why we cannot use our healthcare system today in the same way as a high throughput mechanism for understanding basic biomedicine. I show this slide to remind myself that uh, this is something that we published in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, two months ago, that there is a much bigger um, ecosystem of data than just the, the healthcare data. Shown in the blue shading is the traditional healthcare data, such as medications, laboratory studies, and various physical examinations, and radiology studies. But there's a much bigger healthcare ecosystem, including uh, the social web, genomics, direct consumer genomics, environmental monitoring, and so on. And I would want to make the point here that all of these, and I'll try to illustrate this somewhat in this talk, all of these are relevant to understanding the state of the patient, the future state of the patient, and how they respond to perturbations that are intended to be therapeutic. And here's another point. Even in places like Europe, where we do have a universal health identifier, we do not have universal health identifiers that link a clinical encounter to a tweet, a blog post, or environmental measurement. 
So this tells you, my fellow computer scientists, that there is an interesting challenge here on probabilistic linkage and set membership that is going to have to be solved regardless of which country your healthcare system is found in. I put this slide up to remind myself that we have a, uh, we have a very successful ecosystem where I'm just showing you the, the United States part of it, but it's actually worldwide. There was a, um, a project which is now winding down in terms of formal grant sponsorship called I2B2, Informatics for Integrating Biology and Medicine Science. And back in 2003, I asked the question, could we use the entirety of healthcare systems as living laboratories for discovery research? At the time when I talked to my colleagues, for example, David Altshuler, they thought it was ludicrous, but David got it wrong at least that time. And um, what we said was, let's use all this data instead of creating a parallel um, research system. And we created software, free and open source, that's been used now by over 80 academic health centers in the United States and uh, at least 30 internationally. And when I say it's free and open source, it is it's indeed free, but uh, it requires a lot of uh, investment in extracting data from an electronic medical record, ETL processes, the data normalization, the data cleaning, and so on. So when people adopt the software, they're making a very significant investment, yet it provides such value that, as you see, just in the United States, it has huge value. Shown here are recruitment rates of samples of patients discarded for clinical care. So these are patients that are identified phenotypically by using both the codified data and the natural language process data to identify, for example, patients with major depression or major depression or um, asthma. And as you see here from these discards, patients who come in, let's say, for a cholesterol check, were able to obtain on the order of 300, 400 samples per week in a relatively small healthcare system like Partners Healthcare System here in Boston. And um, at an incremental cost, only about $20, including DNA extraction. So $20 per sample and hundreds of samples a week, that's approximately, at least in order of magnitude, faster and cheaper than previously possible. So that's a disruptive capability by doing high throughput phenotyping and uh, using these discarded samples. And not only is it fast and cheap, but it also worked pretty well too. Shown here is a simple plot of um, SNPs on the x-axis, uh, odds, ratio, odds ratio on the y-axis for rheumatoid arthritis, shown with the blue dots, was a previous genome-wide association study that was done the old-fashioned expensive way, millions of dollars, several years, and we were able to reproduce that same study for literally 1% uh, of the cost and 1% of the time because we're using an electronic medical record uh, for, uh, with uh, these discarded samples. And in the red dots, you see our uh, odds ratios for each of those steps. And you can see for GWAS, it's pretty darn good reproducibility. And here's the point. We were able to, by pressing the button, Redo the entire study, something that no one had ever done before, which is repeat the study for underrepresented populations. That is, we did the first such study for African Americans and Hispanic Americans, which previously were under, super under, underrepresented, but because they're overrepresented in hospital populations for a variety of reasons, we could actually do those studies and show, in this case, that they had very similar uh, genomic risk profile. So it turns out that multiple hospitals adopted this I2B2 software for uh, analyzing whole healthcare systems. And among the hospital systems that acquired these were all the Harvard affiliated hospitals. But then I tried to, and I succeeded ultimately, to create a distributed query system across these hospitals. Now let me just introduce you to an axiom that if you're not a doctor, you will not be aware of this axiom. But the closer two hospitals are geographically in space, the more they hate each other. And so therefore, uh, having these Harvard hospitals all together in Boston tells you we're at the epicenter of mutual loathing. And yet, we were able to figure out the governance and the uh, Institutional Review Board compliance such that any investigator could issue a query to this system. 
and this should be query would go out to all of these uh, hospital systems. They would each keep their own data. And this covered approximately uh, 6 million patients and 10 billion facts. And so I was really quite uh, delighted when one of my um, uh, egocentric uh, Google alerts uh, notified me that someone had cited one of my papers, a small paper describing this distributed query system. But what was the paper that cited us? It was a paper in Nature. And what was this paper in Nature? It was a study done by a small group of investigators at Beth Israel looking at a disease that kills women in their uh, third trimester. It's called peripartum cardiomyopathy. And it's a killer. And these, page, these uh, investigators had a very good idea um, and a good hypothesis with some preliminary data suggesting that they were right regarding the balance of angiogenic factors, blood uh, growth, blood vessel growth uh, generating factors that may contribute to this uh, disease, but they had insufficient number of patients. Without consulting us, which is exactly the way we intended to, they used this system, this entire healthcare system, and across these competing hospitals, and they were able to find four or more handfuls of these patients confirming their findings and able to publish. Now, I want to make a point here. There is no way they could have ever found those patients. They would have had to go through too many records, across too many hospitals, but we made it possible, possible for them in weeks to get this done. And they could iteratively explore until they were sure they had the right patients. That's transformative in terms of research. I want to show the next slide. This is a uh, mountain uh, that we have flown several plane loads of patients into. Now, we all know about the Malaysian airliner and how horrible it is that we can't uh, find it. But this is actually more horrible, because until we did the analysis, we did not even know that we had lost hundreds of plane loads of passengers into this mountain. What is this mountain? This is a mountain of, in Boston, in our leading hospital, of heart attacks, of heart attacks increasing uh, incidence of up to 18%. We did not know that this mountain of heart attacks was happening until we, the nerds did the uh, analysis uh, post factum. And guess what? Worse yet, we caused that mountain. That's Viax coming in on and Viax coming off. It was this use of this overzealous use of an otherwise pretty good analgesic that actually caused this huge mountain of heart attack. What more can we say about a healthcare system where when we applaud 1% decrease in heart attacks, we're willy-nilly, without knowing it, causing 18% decrease in heart attacks. And by the way, it need not have happened because back at the beginning of that mountain, there were publications suggesting that we should be worried. And some healthcare systems, like the Kaiser Permanente system in Northern California, said, we're worried, we're taking it off for a how can we as quants just be sitting by while our parents and loved ones, other loved ones, are actually being hurt and killed by this medical practice? And just in case you uh, would tell me, hey Zach, this is a post hoc analysis, I can tell you that we did the same analysis in the heat of battle when a drug called rosaglizone or a bandit was suspected of this problem. And sure enough, we found a, uh, I think it was a relative risk of 50% increase relative to other drugs in the same class that we published based on introspection into our just our own healthcare system. And this was used by the FDA to black box that drug. And again, we're not pharmacopedemiologists, we're not uh, experts in this area, but by being quanti quanti uh, quant nerves in the biomedical space, we said, this is something we should be worried about today. And there's a much bigger tapestry that we can be understanding if we look very carefully at the data. Shown here is our lives as viewed through a healthcare system. On the x-axis is years, on the y-axis culled in is various um, numbers of chronic diseases. And so here is four, in red four or five chronic diseases and fewer and fewer diseases and actually no uh, chronic diseases shown in blue. 
And it's very important to see that because it tells you that by age 80, if you are healthy, you are extremely abnormal. And uh, that should tell you something about the controls that you want to have for a study, and, and should tell you something about how likely you are to get different patients. And it's actual, shown here, is an amazing, uh, to me at least, an amazing uh, normogram. On the x-axis, on the y-axis, is the number of facts known. And when I say facts, I mean this in the most technical sense. In a big dimensional uh, uh, table, how many facts do we have? How many rows do we have about each patient? And what it shows you, and on the y, uh, sorry, the x-axis is age. What, what this shows you at every point, at every uh, squiggly normogram, is the likelihood that you're gonna die in the next three years. And this shows you that just by looking at the fact count, we have a really good handle on how likely you're going to die in the next three years. But guess what? Do any, does any doctor know this? No. Does even a healthcare insurance company know this? No. Think about the predictive algorithms that you could go to town with if you knew this, plus just a little bit more. What about the behavior of doctors? Shown here is for one laboratory test, the white blood count, how long it takes to reorder the white blood count. The y-axis is the days to reorder the test. And what it shows you is that the extremes, at the very low white counts and the very high white counts, you have a very short time to reorder. Why? Because in those situations, you're very worried about the patient. And in the middle, you're not so worried about the patient. Now, of course, some of the worry relates specifically to the count itself, and the rest of it globally to your gestalt of the patient. But here's a point I want to make. This is a much smoother uh, measure of normality as crowdsourced from thousands of doctors working on millions of patients than any standard normal range for laboratory values. Uh, moreover, the same white blood count can be done for different ages, so for different uh, age groups from newborn all the way to adults, you can see the different normal ranges. And here's the fun part. If you use the most uh, simple machine learning uh, toolkit, let's say logistic regression, on just about 50 of the uh, laboratory variable, laboratory studies that are done on the admission of patient, and just measure the how sick the patient is by virtue of how likely the, the test to be, is to be reordered based on the value of the test on admission, you can actually predict length of stay of the patient without any tweaking of 75 to 80 percent area of the curve. And you can do much, much better if you decide to tweak it. Again, when you're admitted, no doctor knows this about you. But you guys, and ladies, could actually come up with those predictive algorithms. And I'll skip by the slide, but out of the interest of time. Here's another slide. Another patient. This circle, around the periphery circle, I have clumped together the billing diagnoses, the uh, discharge diagnoses, after an emergency room visit of the patient into these larger categories. The patient comes into the healthcare system at the center of this uh, circle, and as they come closer to culture to the present, they come closer and closer to the periphery of that circle. And you see them bounce around with all these different diagnoses. I want you to consider for five seconds, and then I will ask you for a diagnosis. I'd like you to consider five seconds. What is the diagnosis of the patients? And have no fear, I've asked this question for approximately 500 uh, medical audiences, and they never get it. So you can't do worse. All right, what's the diagnosis? Who said domestic abuse? Have you heard my talk before? Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> oh, come on. Where is your sense of fair play? All right. Yes, it's domestic abuse. And what we have done, actually, is we trade across all the, the um, admissions, uh, all the uh, discharges from emergency rooms in Massachusetts, all patients. And we were able to come up with a naive Bayes predictor that predicted, on average, two years before the healthcare system was aware of it, and up to six years before the healthcare system was aware of it. 
domestic abuse. Now again, think what if this is your mother, daughter, or sister, because typically it's women who are abused domestically, think how you feel about a healthcare system that can't detect it for two years or up to six years when a simple naive base predictor can do it. What the heck is going on? And why are you not in there in the trenches coding up those predictors? These are not observations that we're all so proud about when we do a SNP GWAS when we see, oh, odds ratio 1.8. These are odds ratios of the tent. This is really actionable stuff. So I show this slide just to say there are a multitude of data sets that you could go to town with if you just stretch your wings a little bit further and include a large set of data. So this is uh, this slash diagram shows where is the different prevalence of autism in this country based on a uh, sample of 33 million patients, of which 56,000 have autism across the country. And I chose to study this with a, with a colleague of mine, uh, Finale Doshi, he graduated from MIT two years ago, and now, uh, two years later, impressively, is, has just accepted a tenure track position at the um, SEAS faculty at Harvard. And what we did is we used the ITB2 network, and we said, let's get a just-in-time distributed query system that we call Shrine, I forgot to mention that. And we created this Shrine system across eight sites, and in doing so, we had the largest comorbidity study, a large study of other diseases associated with autism to date. In fact, we had, I believe, 40, over 14,000 patients with autism. And we said, let's not look at just the behavioral, emotional components of autism. Let's look at all the medical components. And in fact, it turns out that there's about 5,000 medical comorbidities of autism of various frequencies. And so what we did is and this is actually mostly Finale's work, or I should call it Professor, Professor Doshi now. She, what she did is she turned each of the 15-year histories of these patients into bit vectors in the following way. For every six-month chunk of the patient, she created a 5,000-element bit vector, say 1-0, depending on whether or not you had a disease, that one of those 5,000 comorbidities during that period. And then she did a simple clustering uh, exercise that would have been, that would have looked exactly identical to the clustering code that you would have seen from uh, the yeast cluster experiments of Bopsi et al. around uh, 14, 15 years ago. And what she found across these patients is the following. Now it's known that 20% of kids and adults with autism have epilepsy, but she found one distinct cluster that had a huge, as you see, greater than 80% uh, component of seizures, of, of epilepsy, distinct from the other groups. And there was another disjoint group that had a lot of infections, ear infections, viral infections, lung infections, chlamydial infections, um, inflammatory bowel disease, and this distinct cluster looks a lot like an immunological cluster, looks a lot like a problem with innate immunity a very distinct disease. And then she did a, found a third cluster, which looks very psychiatric. A lot of anxiety disorder, attention deficit disorder, and um, schizophrenia. And so what we've done, just by looking at the phenotype, is really identify three very different diseases. And when you study the genetics, you want to study three different diseases, not together, but separately. It's as if you want to do a GWAS, on all heart disease, lumping together atherosclerosis, viral myocarditis, and uh, myocarditis, a my, my, a cardiomyopathy based on genetic uh, disorders. That would be very, very noisy. You want to separate it into its uh, some subcomponents. And here, just using this data, we're identifying the three new diseases that all happen to be called autism, but in a few more years, they'll have a very different name. And I, this slide is to remind me that the comorbidities of these patients are amazingly constant across different healthcare systems, across uh, different patient populations. This is Wake Forest uh, versus Children's Hospital Boston. So I'm also now going to take a brief tangent 
go back to that diagram I showed you, that diagram from, from JAMA about big data, to show you that there are data outside the healthcare system which are useful. So this is the way we typically think about data flowing from the patient to the regulatory or public health authorities. It's probably almost a platitude these days to say that given uh, the internet and the social web, we now have a much more egalitarian um, configuration where data can flow between any of these parties uh, in a non-hierarchical fashion. But that sounds pretty namby-pamby and non-actionable. And so another way I would like to say it is we could take that big mess, this is the work of John Brownstein, that big mess of the social web and actually organize it such that we can actually predict ahead of public health authorities, for example, important uh, phenomena. So for example, um, as summarized in this article in the New England Journal, John and his crew have gone on and done some very impressive world-scale epidemiology using the social web. So this is something called Health Map. I grew up in Geneva, Switzerland, and I imagined that there was a big room like this with DEFCON 5 screens showing all the uh, uh, big outbreaks happening across the world uh, and you know, protecting us from these outbreaks. Of course, none of those rooms don't, do not exist, except now they do because both the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the WHO actually use Health Map. And what is Health Map? Health Map is a map of all infectious diseases in all locations at all times. And what it does is 24 hour by 7 it mines a variety of data sources and, um, in a, a and drops into a variety of locations information about the patient based on fairly straightforward parsing of the record as shown in this cartoon. What has happened, when, and where. And as you see, lots and lots of different alerts are used from a lot of data sources in a lot of different languages. And all these documents are characterized uh, and classified systematically and automatically across all these languages, across all these diseases. And so what's amazing for something like H1N1, they were able to track from the index case that appeared in a news story in Mexico all the way the entire international outbreak. The CDC reports a thousand foodborne illnesses per year. Health Map reports 10,000 foodborne illnesses a year. You can say, well, yes, that's just quantity. What about quality? Well, this is the distribution. This is what some of the data sources, like Yelp. Some of us may either turn our nose up at or be impressed. Don't ever go to this place and eat again. And yet, look at the distribution of these food, the categories of these food board houses. Exactly the same between the CDC and this health map point sources, except that 10 times as many outbreaks we've detected and at much, much lower cost. It's a democratization and decentralization of epidemiology. And the FDA now has a trial, again with John's group, called Medlock Picture Social, where they're using the social web to look for um, various comments about drugs where they, despite the typos and despite spelling variations, they identify, and invented words, they identify um, various relationships between drugs and outcomes in such a way that they can report them systematically to, uh, the, to the CDC, to, to the FDA. And so far, that trial seems to be going pretty well. Again, it's a different mode of thinking. I want to give a shout out to my colleague um, Shrak Patel that we recently recruited uh, from Stanford where he's done exactly the same trick that we did with uh, genome-wide association studies, but he did it with environmental-wide association studies. So you may or may not know that there are these studies called the NHANE study that happened at regular intervals where 
um, sampled patients, spe uh, specifically sampled to be represented across our country, are selected, and then they're, in addition to a bunch of questions and, and anthropometric measurements, they are blood and urine sampled and run a mass spec for a variety of uh, heavy metals and small molecules. And what you see here is a study where on the on the y-axis, just as for a GWAS, you have uh, the log p-value of a uh, significant disequilibrium relative to a disease, in this case, uh, type 2 diabetes. And on the x-axis, instead of chromosomes in the Manhattan plot and SNPs within those chromosomes, what you see are categories of, of compounds and individual compounds <laughs> instead of SNPs. And you see that a few of them exceed uh, Bonferroni uh, correction for, for multiple hypothesis testing. And you see one, and this is reproduced in multiple studies, not just two studies. You see a, a epoxide that is a common uh, pollutant that causes an increased risk. And you see a vitamin metabolite that also reproducibly, um, beyond Bonferroni correction, causes a decreased risk for type 2 diabetes. And this is incredibly important because as much as we like to look at genomics, and I do myself, it's important to remember that for most common diseases, heritability is only about 50% defined in narrow sets. So that means that the variance from non-genomic sources is about 50%. And so it's a pretty sad thing to just uh, ignore that other half. But you have a toolkit, intellectually and computationally, to address this source. So now I'm going to try to switch gears and go to the e ferret arm, the, the business part of making things happen. And so I hosted at Harvard a, a clinical bioinformatics summit maybe three years ago now and asked what was it going to take to create clinical grade uh, genomic sequencing so that we could go beyond the uh, heroic acts of teams of real informatics wizards uh, bioinformatics wizards to actually turn this into a clinical routine thing. Unfortunately, it became clear to me that the conference was turning into what every such conference turns into, which is an argument around standards. Now, don't get me wrong, standards are incredibly important, but they're incredibly boring. And they will also take forever to happen. And again, growing up in Switzerland, I'm all too aware of how great an excuse standards are for sitting around in fancy uh, restaurants overlooking beautiful vistas and talking about where is the right place to put the comma in the standard. So instead, what I suggested was, let's create a contest. Let's create a contest where we're going to take uh, several families with a child with a really bad disease that's going to kill them. And let's, and where we have suspicion that it's genetic, and we're going to take the families and have consent to make their data available to the contestants. We'll get the uh, several genome sequencing companies to make the data available, uh, the sequencing uh, available essentially for free, pro bono. And I got the uh, CEO of Children's Hospital Boston to put in a $25,000 prize. And we put the data out there. And what was really gratifying was that we had 30 teams um, come to the table to actually uh, do this uh, contest, 30 teams internationally. And I'm showing here from a recent genome biology uh, publication where we summarized the experience, all the <laughs> authors of all the, uh, of all the teams. And here's the point. Teams came together that previously had not come together. And, came, and out of the 30 teams, seven of them converged on the very same uh, diagnoses. And what was quite uh, unexpected but certainly heartwarming, was this child, Adam, had gone for 11 years without a diagnosis. And the, the leading teams actually converged on the particular genetic diagnosis for his previously phenomenological diagnosis, central nuclear myopathy. And they actually found the etiological diagnosis. And the mother celebrated that by giving him a birthday cake with the name of the gene that, in which the pathological variant was found. Turned out she has a, a variant too, so she's been worked up for heart disease right now. But there's a number of points I want to make here. First of all, 
the, the winning teams included hospitals where Adam had been seen previously, and the doctors had not been able to diagnose him. Yet by having it together, the right bioinformatics and genomics, methodologists and clinicians come together in a way that they never come together for real in the healthcare system, we were able to come up with this diagnosis and that of, an, of, of a second child. That's one. Second, it was amazing to me how many teams shared the same pipelines, the same analytic pipelines, but came up with completely different results. So I think we're all somewhat aware of the fact that the, if you send the same uh, sequencing platform results to a different uh, assembly and variant calling pipeline, uh, you're going to have uh, some different results. But I'm telling you that even with the same pipeline, the interpretations are quite different depending on what the teams look like. So there's a team structure that actually is functional versus one that's dysfunctional. And all of them seem to work approximately better than the healthcare system does today. So when we talk about precision medicine or individualized medicine, I think what we're hoping for is to be able to predict precisely, or to state precisely, what is the probability of the disease given the findings. And specifically, we, our best case should be that we should be able to say that something has a high likelihood or a low likelihood high probability or low probability, and have a very narrow set of confidence intervals around that, that estimate. So just to see how doctors are about estimating this, we ask the following question. If a, OK, I'm going to give you a test for disease. What? Ah. I'm going to give you a test for disease. So wake up, because I'm going to ask you a little math question. Not math, a rhythmic question. So this is a disease, let's call it zombie disease. And zombie disease has an incidence, a prevalence of one in a thousand. And this test is 100% sensitive. No false negatives. It misses no zombies. And it is 95% specific. All right, here it goes. You've got, I'm going to ask five questions, and your hand better go up one of those times. Everybody's hands up. Who, if I say that Donna over there, Donna Sloan, is positive for that one, for that uh, it's positive for that uh, zombie test, how likely is it that she is in fact a zombie? Those of you who think Donna is a zombie, 100, hands up. <laughs> Other than what you know. You're not allowed to use any other data. How many hands up with you? 100% uh, Donna Zahn. 95%. Few hands. 70 70%. 20%. 5%. 1%. All right. Pretty good. You had a spread, I'd say your mode was around uh, somewhere between 5 to 20 percent. We asked this, so this question, this exact question, was asked of Harvard doctors 30 years ago. And recently we asked a bunch of Harvard, Harvard doctors and medical students the same question. It's pretty uncreative. And then we published the answers. And, and the answers were the same as it was 30 years ago. So that's my, my, my hint to the students here. Just publish the same thing every 30 years. Uh, and what we showed was nothing had changed. That here's the estimates that people had of the, the uh, likelihood that Donna had is a zombie. And you see a bunch of them thought it was extremely likely, a, a bunch of them thought it was modestly likely. Some crazy doctors actually thought it was less likely than the prevalence that they would actually, that she was a zombie. And just to wake you up, just to remind you how it really works, you have a thousand patients. You have that one true positive, so that's one. And you have a specificity of 95%, so you have 5% false positives. 5% out of 1,000 is 50, so you have 50 false positives. So out of the 51 positives, only one out of 51 is a true positive. So that's around 2%, all right? 
Most doctors don't get that, and about 30% uh, of you don't get that. Go back to school. How about that? Um, we'll get back to that. I was searching through the web for a, a slide about doctors working with patients, and I saw this slide. And I was both amused and appalled by it. By the way, I got this cre Creative Commons slide, so I didn't do anything. But this is the real slide, and I give it the Creative Co Commons attribution below it. I want to point out, the slide says, doctors and residents working with patients. That's what the, the where the heck are the patients? <laughs> so unfortunately, this is very realistic. This is the face of modern medicine. A bunch of good-looking young people looking at computer screens. I thought we signed up for that, not the MDs. And that's really what it's about. And I'll tell you, as someone who has worked as a doctor, it's horrific. You're desperately trying to get away from the damn computer. But everything's about looking at the computer, getting results out, documenting the business. It's impossible to see the patient. There's something very broken about the healthcare system and the implementation of automation that this is, in fact, the fix of modern medical care. And the question is, what is in their head? I just showed you not the right things. They don't know how to basically assess uh, the probability of a disease uh, based on a test. And you can say, Zach, you're so wrong. They're, they're, they're intuitive patients. It's not true. They're not. And especially when it comes to genomic tests, they've never seen such a genetic uh, test, and there's a million of them. There's no way they could have developed the Bayesian uh, intuition. And by the way, we all know from many studies in the 80s, human beings are poor uh, Bayesian machines. And the computers, as I said before, suck. These are uh, 1980s technologies. If you want to look, have fun, some fun, look up a language called MUMPS. It's a dynamic language that uh, is also a hierarchical database. Um, and it's the, the language developed at Massachusetts General Hospital in the 1960s that is behind most of the leading implementations of electronic health records in the world. Not SQL or any other modern language. And of course, patients don't really enter into the mix. So what the hell is going on here? And why are you not fixing it? But before we get smug, I just want to say something very briefly to call out uh, a term uh, that I coined called the incidental ohm, the biggest ohm of them all, the ohm of incidental findings. And this is what we, this community, have actually uh, generated. And so an article that I wrote in the Journal of American Medical Association with Russ Altman and Dan Macy's, Russ is another one of the keynote speakers. And we basically made the following uh, observation, was that if you started measuring many, many things in parallel, like thousands of genetic tests, even if you had much better than 95% specificity, if you had 99.99% .99 specificity, 60% of the United States population would be falsely positive. And we would start removing pieces of your body for no apparent reason. And if you think that's a, an exaggeration, let me show you a paper about how many women with BRCA1 variants that 10 years later are known not to be pathogenic, had their breasts and their ovaries removed. Let me remind you of how many thousands of men, because people had a very poor test called the prostate-specific antigen, which should have been called the prostate non-specific antigen, that had tens of thousands of um, prostates removed. But we were silent as a community, and there, were, there was no smart quants saying, what the heck is this test, and what's the possible predictive value, and give me the data. In 2008, I pointed out that uh, this weird guy who uh, <laughs> discovered DNA actually uh, was fully sequenced in uh, Nature, and in Table 3 of that paper in Nature, he's uh, said to be homozygous for uh, three variants, which are textbook cases of, uh, of really bad diseases. And I said, although this guy's weird, he does not have those three, three diseases. And yet, this was actually listed as being a sequencing error, but in fact, it's this, it's this problem. I just want to point out this phylogenetic tree, where on the bottom you see two, um, two Africans that are closely related to other phylogenetically, which is all well and good, until you realize it's the very same patient. The only difference between them is they have different sequencing platforms. Each set to be 99.99% specific, accurate problem. So somehow, they're not the same person, but they're phylogenetically related because they're on different platforms. I'm going to have to go by the slide just because uh, I don't have enough time. I want to just a quick, quick shout out to MacArthur at uh, MGH, who did a very nice paper in science, who 
essentially validated what we should have known in common sense all the time. He showed that essentially, I think it was 20% loss of function variance have no known phenotype. And why is that? Because under most circumstances, we are robust organisms. We don't fall over when we give up, when you just hit a pathway with one uh, uh, loss of function variant. We're, we're much more robust than that, and there are compensatory pathways. And so we should not be surprised, in fact, that a lot of these variants in the outbreak population do not cause disease. But nonetheless, we go off willy nilly. One of our most uh, successful stories in um, genetic testing is on cardiomyopathy due to genetic causes, which has been responsible for a number of high profile deaths on the basketball court and, and other athletes, notably uh, black athletes. And the result of this variance in these uh, in, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a number of athletes have been taken off the court, have had um, uh, implantable defibrillators put in, and have um, had the rest of their um, relatives uh, screened because of concerns around this uh, autosomal dominant disease. So I'm just going to cut to the chase, which is because we now have all the exomes through the SP cohort from the National Heart Lung Blood Institute, we have all the those variants <coughs> available to us. We're able to see the following in the controls in this disease that is one in five hundred in the controls, where we should see only a fraction of one person. Of one person, we see a huge number of controls who have the disease. What's going on? Well, if you look at what the variants are that were found in the this uh, control population in the SV population, you find that five variants account for all of these apparent false positive. And very sadly, these variants are in African Americans. Because of the textbook direction to use ethnicity matched controls, no one used African controls in their studies. And guess what? Because of the diversity of Africans, because they're before the bottleneck. They have these variants, which turn out not to be pathogenic. And we have known that they're not pathogenic had we uh, genotyped the African Americans or the Africans. But instead, we didn't. We based it on Caucasians. And remember what I just said. Think about all the damage that modern day gen genomics did to these families. Implantable defibrillators scared the hell out of the families. And all because we did not have the outbred frequencies of these uh, genetic genes in the general population. So I'm going to start wrapping up, and I want to let my colleague know that I think I have nine minutes, five minutes, uh, seven. seven minutes. I can do it. So this is um, what electronic health record technology looks like today. It's really cool for the 1980s. And why can't it actually be like modern information technology? And so with my colleague, uh, Ken Mandel, I wrote an article in the New England Journal in 2009, just as we saw the 40 to $50 billion investment on electronic health records happening in this country. And we said, hey, why can't healthcare IT be more like the iPhone? Why can't, uh, if I don't like my order entry system or my drug interaction detector, why can't I substitute that app with another app, just as I can substitute my to-do list? Instead, of course, what you have to do is you have to spend literally millions of dollars to substitute that functionality. Just to give you a uh, calibration, the Partners Healthcare System, which is only um, eight hospitals, only two of which are big hospitals, is spending on a seven-year throw upwards of $1.6 billion on the healthcare IT to implement this functionality that is this big model of the functionality. And so we actually defined, we, had, we got grant from the Office of National Coordinator, the same office that is dispersing those uh, uh, 40, 50 billion dollars. We said, why can't we create a thin abstraction layer on top of electronic health records called the Smart Platform? It's basically a very thin, restful API that can be accessed, for example, through uh, HTML5 and access data. And it sits on top of these source data sources, whether they be personal health records, electronic health, uh, institutional health records, or data repositories. And through this API, they provide these 
uh, functionality which can appear as atoms. And to give you a sense of its power, there was this great article in Wired magazine which had a very nice heart risk calculator, except it fully compiled as a PDF. It was just a static picture. And it won their design prize in Wired magazine. We took that picture, that picture that I just showed you here, and in one week with one developer, we compiled it into actual code on our platform to be able to run on three different platforms. Now, te technically this was very successful, but I was very worried to the point of being skeptical that we would succeed in the bigger way because I thought that the electronic health record companies would actually resist their monopolies from being broken by allowing other developers to innovate on their platform. But it turns out, because there's one, there is one uh, developer that's eating everybody else's market share, a bunch of them came together. And uh, unbeknownst to me, at this huge um, convention with about 14,000 attendees around health information management systems, five big booths actually highlighted our technology, which is again free and open source, on top of their electronic like, health record systems. So we're really actually getting real traction. I actually blew by a slide which shows how for the first time we've been able to integrate genomic data with the clinical data for decision making. And this is because we're taking very seriously our responsibility to actually make health IT in this case, not just the discovery portion, but the actual kind of effect of our uh, model. So if we're not going to have this, which I pointed out is the current state of medicine, how are, how are we going to get to this? So what is this? That's McCoy. He's taking care of the patient. This patient is looking rather blue. And that patient, notice he has some decision support with all available genomics and uh, medical knowledge. But he's holding it to the side. He's actually looking at the patient. And the other guy behind is looking for some alien to have, to have an affair with. And, uh, and why? Can't we? In fact, let me rephrase it. I think it is our obligation to actually figure out how to make this vision come to pass. I assure you, the medical establishment has no idea, does not even, does not even know where, where to begin to start to make this happen. So, here's the questions that I want to close, and I'm hoping that you're going to either ask these questions or better questions. But now I have to look at the screen because I can't remember the questions. Okay. So basically, who's going to do this? It's not the healthcare system who's, not, who's going to actually do this. Next question. I've talked to a bit about patient safety, notably in the incidental. I know we all want to get those major science papers, but sometimes we publish a little bit fast. If we want to be actually useful for medicine, let's start publishing facts that withstand the scrutiny of reproducibility and that we want our mother, our sister, or ourselves to be treated with. So are we willing to be that rigorous to hold ourselves to clinical grade knowledge? For those of us who have an engineering bent, are we willing to get, roll, get dirty, to roll up our sleeves and get involved in these horrible antiquated systems with a very reactionary uh, retrogressive healthcare itself. I know that sounds very appealing, but there's a huge uh, stake. And if you don't do it, very few other people will. Let's see who else, what else I said. And if that sounds un unappetizing, how are we going to find an alternative? I see many of my colleagues actually did away with the size by creating knowledge-based companies for genomic interpretation. And that may be the nose of the, of the cattle under the tech. Maybe that the healthcare system is so high bound that we're going to have to disrupt it from outside. And if that's the case, that would be rather sad, but it's better than not doing anything at all. So perhaps that's the alternative. And finally, I'm going to argue if we really want to have a big societal impact, should this not be an ISMB priority? Should not improving our diagnostic, prognostics, and therapeutic decision making be an ISMB priority? 
I also know of any other group that you represent that is, I was going to say better poised, but poised at all to be able to deliver it. So it's really your opportunity, your mandate. And guess what? If you do it, we'll all benefit. And if you don't, it's not going to be good when you show up in the hospital. So thank you very much. Questions, skepticism. A couple of short ones. Yes. Thanks, uh, uh, with, with one, one, one line I found lately is that uh, there's an awful lot of misinformation on the net. There's a lot of folk stuff, there's a lot of uh, warnings and scare stories, a lot of conspiracy stuff about the, uh, what causes autism or, or the effects of fluoride in drinking water or chemtrails and all of this. So it'd be really nice if this could be used as somewhere where people could get sound, safe information. Because if there's so much misinformation, it's, uh, it, 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 it's very, very difficult to fight, to fight back against it's out there. So I think the question is where do we get authoritativeness from? And so I think, unfortunately, there's no way that we actually can bless authoritativeness, or if you do, it takes too darn long. So it turns out that we nerds have actually developed techniques to identify trolls and other various other people. I think that ultimately we need fully um, implemented reputational systems. And the reputations will actually be community-based. We're not going to be able to convince everybody that certain rumors are not true. I think it's a paternalistic uh, pipe dream. However, we can make sure that people who we would agree with if we had a long conversation with them have a voice and essentially the, the moral equivalent of upvoting them so that they become the um, source of uh, veracity. Now, I just, want to, I just want to quickly elaborate. There are places, for instance, like um, the National Library of Medicine, where they have a patient-facing site for the data, but that cannot keep up with the huge volume of data. So again, I think that, that what we have to do is allow multiple communities uh, to, and actually Russ Altman and I wrote a paper maybe 10 years ago, about how to actually allow this distributed authoritative data to take place. Nonetheless, it's a real moral hazard, but guess what? I face this, I don't see patients that much anymore, but I do remember, and so chiropractic is sometimes very, very useful, but what I can assure you is chiropractic cannot do the following, which is what I told one of my patients, with type 1 diabetes, where their immune system is destroyed, their ability to make insulin, they told them to go off of insulin, which was basically sure death. And so that was bad, uh, bad medicine, and we need a way to actually vet this. And I think there are standard certification techniques that are modern age and not the expensive old fashioned way. Any other questions? Hi, um, Terry Gasterland, UCSD. Um, there are genes that are replete with either false positives or not really quite real um, changes, and some the Edison family, the Muck family, the olfactory receptors. Titan is one of the genes on our skip list because it's so long and so difficult to sequence properly. How did you all validate that that was the right gene for this kid? For, for the actual contest gene? Well, I think you're pointing out correctly that Titan is a huge gene. I think it's not big, it's one of, one of the largest genes. And so there was actually that we did some standard validation of it, of it afterwards, and, and, it, and it did, and it did val validate. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there are many other uh, genetic variants that I would have been very skeptical of if we had validated, and I think that we would have seen, I would have hoped we would have seen the, con the contestant say, we can't be sure of this one. But this, this, this particular instance was, anyway, you slice it. And then how did you validate Oh, uh, well, you, we had TRIA. Well, we don't, it's a very good point. So the question is, how do you actually validate causality? And it's a longer story, as you know. We did have TRIO, so we could show that the, it falls with a, with a family. But nonetheless, that does not prove causality in itself either. Well, the ultimate proof of causality has to be something like uh, model systems where you take it, remove it, and, uh, uh, and reinsert that variant. I don't think we, we achieved that level uh, of proof. Unfo and 
I have to say that um, that's probably where the future lies. I, I was pleased to be able to be awarded something called the uh, Coordinating Center for the Undiagnosed Disease Network, where we're actually going to do this nationwide. And so our first cut is to do exactly what was heard, but it doesn't get the causality. And so what's going to be competed out shortly is a bunch of validation centers where they're looking at the biology. So ultimately, that has to be done, I think, if you want to have a higher degree of um, security that this is indeed is the, is the causal barrier. But, on top, but short of that, you do the best, we, the best we can. And given what was known about that gene, and what we learned about physiology, and what was known about the family, that seems to be the most plausible. Is it an ironclad causal case? No. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I'm past speaking up, and there will be time for questions afterwards. Uh, now, please join the ISCD in thanking Dr. Kalani for his fantastic presentation.